So my name is Christian Hendricks, Christian Dave. I'm the Gene Jones Director of Public Programs here at the Nevada Museum of Art. Uh, and I'm really delighted to welcome you all to the Link Computer and for today's part by Protecting Nevada's Dark Skies, which is a sort of multi-pronged presentation today. It's a, with Friends of Nevada Wilderness, uh, it's just complete for Peterson mostly, just a little bit more about him a few. I'd like to start off by recognizing and acknowledging that the Nevada Museum of Art is located in the Great Basin on the occupied territories of indigenous people. The state of Nevada consists of 27 federally recognized tribes uh, from four nations the Northern Paiute, Shoshone, Washoe, and Southern Paiute people. We welcome our guest artists today, along with our indigenous partners and friends who may be joining us today. A couple of pieces of housekeeping before we get started. Um, today's Art Night Lecture Series is supported in part by the Nevada Humanities, as well as the Core Humanities Program at the University of Nevada, Reno, which uh, also covers and supports free admission for students. So we definitely thank them for their support. We couldn't do this without them. Um, today's program is also being streamed live on Zoom. That's why you see a camera right here and my colleague, Christina, over here. So hello to our friends that are on Zoom. Um, if we're going to have a Q&A after Kirk's presentation today, so for the folks online, um, please queue up any questions and Christina will be able to get those to us, and the same for our audience uh, as we'll have a Q&A after Kirk's talk. So today's talk, uh, I wanted to know in particular, um, a bit of like sad news is that we were supposed to be joined by Sophie Shepard as today's talk is um, presented in conjunction with the exhibition the Moon's Tear, The Desert Night Dream, which you'll see in the theater lobby right out the front, um, in celebration of Sophie Shepard's newest book, which is printed um, or published by our good friend at Sundance Books and about press. Uh, do we have any Sundance folks in the house today? Maybe running a little bit late. So this is a fantastic book that you can purchase at our museum shop or at Sundance Books, just right behind us. Um, and check out the exhibition that's, that's there. Sophie's not able to join us today due to illness and winter travel conditions. And she lives up in Surprise Valley, a very, very dark stretch of uh, wilderness. So we, I hope she's joining us online. We send her our best and hope she can be with us. So today's guest, uh, Kurt Peterson, has over 30 years' experience traveling and photographing the Bible's backcountry in the wilderness area. And most recently, spent over 10 years as a National Park Service Ranger uh, in national monuments around Flagstaff, uh, Chaco Canyon area, as well as in Manzanarca in Eastern California along the Eastern Sierra Range. Um, over the past several years, he's been collecting data with the past dark skies, assisting the National Forest, uh, the Forest Service with wilderness character monitoring and acting as the organization. That's written about uh, wilderness, uh, wilderness historian. With that, I'm going to go ahead and bring up Kurt Peterson and um, I'll see you a little bit later for the question and answer. Thanks. Wow, I have to admit, I'm a little bit of COVID shock. This is more people than I've been around in the past two years. <laughs> Please forgive me if I seem a little bit nervous. Um, I was, we were definitely hoping to have she Sophie Shepard with us today in this presentation about the dark sky, and I wanted her to read her book. I feel that the, as a third generation Great Basin painter, I feel the book is a shining example of the inspiration that comes from living under the Nevada's dark skies. I would also like to acknowledge her father, Craig Shepard's sublime watercolors. The Black Rock Desert that inspired my art as I explored the vast desert using session wheelers, books as my guides back in the early days. Friends of Nevada Wilderness is a conservation organization founded in 1974, and we obtained our 501c3 status in 1985. Our mission Friends of Nevada Wilderness is dedicated to preserving all qualified public lands as wilderness, protecting all present and potential wilderness from ongoing threats, educating the public about the values of the need for wilderness and improving and managing and improving the management and restoration of wildlife. We accomplish our goals through stewardship projects, 
advocation, educating, and outreach, which is why we're here today. If you'd like to learn more about Friends, I encourage you to talk with our folks at the table just outside the front door or visit our website. There's also a couple of members of our board in the audience. Uh, if, if you, I'll get them to identify themselves a little bit later. They will do question and answers, and they, they can answer questions for the chair. As an organization over the past five years, we have listened to the rising voices and considered how our organization can improve on social and environmental justice issues and responsibilities. At Friends of Nevada Wilderness, we believe wilderness preservation is the best way to protect lands within the current system, but also acknowledge shortcomings and recognizing the people who stewarded these lands for generations. The narrative of conservation often excludes the armed clashes that led to the foundation of our public land system and the violent removal of indigenous communities that made wild landscapes uninhabited. In the light of these objectives, me, in the light of these objectives, I would like to acknowledge that we are speaking today from the traditional homeland of the Wasatchian or the Washoe people. The Washoe have lived in this area for at least nine thousand years. In tribal lore, it says that they've been here since the beginning of time. I don't know if many of you are aware of this, but there was a recent discovery at White Sands, New Mexico, of human footprints, and at the beginning of time. These were found in the Pleistocene, the very end of the Pleistocene, in the beginning of time where indigenous people in North America has been pushed back to at least 23,000 years. Washington Territory encompasses some of the most iconic lands in northern Nevada. These lands include Lake Tahoe, the Truckee River from Tahoe to the Truckee Meadows, and including the Truckee Meadows, Washoe Valley, all of Carson Valley with the Pinion Forest and Hills to the east, and much of the headwaters of the Carson and Walker Rivers. All this changed with the discovery of silver in the Comstock in 1859. By 1870s, the Washoe had been displaced from their traditional lands and were considered by Indian agents as being, quote, insufficient in number, unquote, to have a reservation within their traditional lands. In 1951, the Washoe filed the Indian, with the Indian Claims Commission for the lands and resources in silver. They received a settlement of $5 million in 1970. As I walk you through the Nevada dark skies, I would like to invite you to remember how important the dark skies have been for the Washoe and the other Nevada nations stretching back over the past 1,200 generations. What do you feel when you watch the long shadows of the afternoon slowly dissolve into the sunset? What do you think about when the stars appear in the sky? How does your imagination push forward? All of us have ventured into the wild, the dark places, known stars. Nancy Newhall wrote of the wonder of the dark skies in her 1960 book, This is the American Earth. You shall know the night, its space, its light, its music. You shall see the earth sink in darkness and the universe appear. No roof shall shut you from the presence of the moon. You shall see mountains rise in the transparent shadows before dawn. You shall see and feel the first light and hear a ripple in the stillness. In the book, A World Without Stars, Robert Trotta explores the deep influence of astronomical phenomena on shaping human history and imagination. From mythology, religion, farming, creative arts to mathematics, astronomy, navigation, technology, and scientific thought. The stars were our first clock and calendar, and they shaped the way we think about and relate to time. To paraphrase Carl Sagan, we're not only made from star stuff, but we 
but our collective human intellect is organized and stimulated by the rhythms, patterns, and aberrations of the stars. Since our first hominid ancestors began up walking upright into the savannas of Africa, the stars and dark skies have been our companions and sources of wonder. Two million years ago, our ancestors may have marveled at an enormous gas bubble that rivaled and exceeded the full moon in brightness and size. This phenomenon resulted from a sudden flare up of Milky Way's central black hole called Sagittarius A prime. This is a phenomenon we humans may witness again. In the dawn sky of the year 1054, this astronomical phenomenon appeared. It was the Crab Supernova and was recorded by Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Arab astronomers. If you had been on the Panasco Blanco Trail in Chaco Canyon around noon and worked up from the shade beneath the canyon wall, you would have seen this. And possibly you would have felt compelled to document what you saw with a pictograph on the overhang above you. We will have a chance to, to see a Nova again next year. It will, however, be a red Nova, much less, excuse me, much less energetic than the crab supernova, but it will be about a quarter of the distance, only 1800 light years, as opposed to the crab nova, which was 6,500 light years away. It will appear as a temporary extension of Cygnus's kind of constellation right wing, but please resist the temptation to mark the event with your speed on natural formations. Astronomers estimate that we have a comfort zone of about 50 light years from the supernova fallout. The last time the Earth felt the effect of a supernova was about 2.5 million years ago. The explosion took place 325 light years away, six and a half times further than the major zone, but the Earth is still affected. Some iron, or iron isotopes have been found on the floor of our oceans. They can only have been generated in the core of us. Exploding star. Dark skies have become an issue because of the prevalence of light pollution in the modern world. This is what the United States looks like after dark. Our default objective of night lighting has been based upon the assumption that we need to illuminate, fully illuminate darkness. This assumption does not take into consideration that darkness is an integral part of our Earth's ecosystem and is necessary for the health and welfare of humans, wildlife, and the biodiversity of Earth. In humans, studies have demonstrated that disruption of the diurnal cycles of light and dark can have detrimental impacts on immune, mental, and gastrointestinal health. I just wanted to point out real quick, can people remember what this line is from geography? It's the 100th meridian which is, separates the East United States from the West. It's also the line where the humidity stops and farming becomes something that doesn't exist on every acre of land. And it also is the land, what if we also think about land of dominated by private property, dominated by public lands. And as you can see, these are the dark patches in the lower 48. Going into Nevada here. In Nevada, we are blessed with some of the deepest pools of darkness remaining in the United States. As part of protecting natural resources and the naturalness of wild Nevada places, Friends of Nevada Wilderness has been working on getting dark sky recognitions for public land locations within Nevada. What we're going to first look at is this part right up here. This is on the tri state border. Uh, this is where Sophie Shepherd lives in the Surprise Valley. This is uh, Sheldon area up in here. We have also the Bassett program. And Oregon is working on a massive 11 million acre dark sky recognition for that southeastern part of Oregon. But as you can see, that's also part of our major dark sky area. Anybody want to guess what that light source is right there? The prairie. 
It's on the edge of the Black Rock High Rock MCA. It's a high rock mine. So what we're going to look at is uh, the other thing that's up here is massacre rent study area. I'm just right up in this area here. This is massacre rent. Friends of the Nevada Wilderness started working with the Bureau of Land Management in 2016 to get dark sky recognition for massacre rent. Uh, this is a Google Earth image of it. Massacre Rim will do the study area. Pretty much, it's great. It looks like the continent of Australia. The actual look is kind of not yes. But these are the roads that we drive on to take the dark sky reading. Just a cherry stem that goes up a little bit into the wilderness area. The wilderness area is bounded by this Massacre Rim or the Massacre Triway. And this is the eastern path, which is a really rough road. And very few of us drive this road anymore because it was an old mining road and it's really rough. And I remember we were up there driving it and it was the middle of the night. We had to stop a couple of times to move rocks off the road. And then I kind of noticed it was straight down. <laughs> it's like, wow, I don't want to drive this in the daytime. I want to see how far. <laughs> but each one of these head drops represents a uh, site. And we usually try to get at least the perimeter of these sites done every year. Which is something we have to do to maintain the dark sky status. Inventory work involves driving around at night on very rough roads and making brief stops to measure the brightness of the sky. It's very important to reduce the light that you are exposed to to maintain your night vision. And once you do, the indicators of a really truly dark sky is to be able to see your shadow cast by the galactic center of the Milky Way. And again, if you're interested, the Milky Way is seasonal. It appears, I believe, after March, it pretty much goes away by the end of October. Um, but don't quote me on that one. It is really amazing that once your eyes adjust to the darkness, you can see very clearly, of course, it probably does have a little bit of artificial light, which is very little. When I worked in Chaco, we always walk home from our dark sky presentations and a completely total dark sky, seeing our way by starlight on the paths and trails in front. This is Master Rim. And one thing I want to point out is see the glow down here? That's the dark, or that's the sky glow from Reno. And 150 miles away. And the other really good indicator of a very dark sky, these are clouds. And you see they're black against the sky. There's no light coming up from above. In March 2019, Massacre Rim was formally recognized as dark sky sanctuary. This is uh, just south of Massacre Rim, at the end of one of those very long nights of vlogging the sky. You see that just it's the end of astronomical twilight or astronomical darkness because you're starting to see a little bit of color in the sky. You're also, if you notice in this photo, that there's this pronounced glow through here. That's the zodiacal light that appears in the evenings and mornings, particularly in the, the equinox seasons. And it's the back scattering of light on the dust and ashes. Another really good indicator of the dark sky. And does anybody recognize this pleasant little guy right here? That's the farthest point we can see for our naked eye. That's our neighboring galaxy, Andromeda. As I mentioned before, to maintain the status of the dark sky sanctuary, we have to inventory these dark sky sites every year. 2020 was a very difficult year to inventory in because of all the smoke and fire. But this was a little bit later. This is pre dawn. Very clearly see that patch of zodiacal light. That's Venus. And this is smoke. Fortunately for a dark sky monitor, the smoke has an impact only up about 15 or 20 degrees. Maybe a slight impact on the stars, but enough to get our readings.
I'll go back to Nevada because I want to talk about another place that we're working on for dark skies on other plants in Nevada and also on conservation. This is a region of, that we are particularly interested in, is this central core. And we have given it the name the lunar starlight area because it's the central part of it in here is lunar craters. And it's also surrounded by this incredible complex of wilderness character lands. This is the lunar crater region right in here. These are wilderness study areas, all these things that are shaded. For those of you who like the mountain wildernesses, I think this is Table Mountain, and they continue on this way with Alpha Kiva, and then uh, further over is Arbella. These are lands identified with wilderness characteristics. This is the Confucian Hills, Art Hills, down here, Goblin Knobs, a really amazing place. And this is the uh, Castle Rock area. So all these lands are wilderness quality lands. And if you haven't been there, it's an amazing place to visit daytime or nighttime. This is Lunar Crater. This is the Playa out by Lunar Crater. And see these guys? These are the traveling rocks, which are actually quite common in high desert Playa systems. They're caused by ice freezing you know, on the surface. And when the wind blows, it starts dragging the rocks that are frozen into it. You see these guys just plowed through the pebbles beneath the little water while the rocks were receiving that pressure from the ice. This is the Confucian Hills area, another really outstanding beautiful area. If anybody's interested in history, just south of this, Jedediah Smith crossed the state in 1827. Castle Rock with the Cowich over the study area in the background. And it's just some of the many, many, many outstanding formations in the Goblin Mountain area. The real star of this area is from the sunrise. This is why we call it the starlight area. It has world class dark skies. This is at the Lunar Lake. This is right underneath Mori Peak Wilderness Study Area, which is right here. See the sky glow? Vegas, 170 miles away, 75 miles away. Goblin Mountains, and a few more of those great iconic formations behind the tent. And this is back at uh, Lunar Lake. But I wanted to point out that that supernova that we will get a chance to see in 2022, if the astronomers are correct, um, it will appear to be as bright as one of the stars in the Big Dipper. So it's definitely something to keep an eye out for. One of the other projects that Fringe of Nevada is currently working on involves a wide diversity of partners in on the dark to our park to park and the dark route. And what this is is a route that starts at Baker here, goes up through it's highway six, or actually yeah, highway six and fifty actually, goes up into uh, Ely and then winds its way down through our lunar starlight area into Tonopah. When I first looked at this map I was like that's going to be Tonopah. No. Anybody know what that is? Round Mountain High. Round Mountain High. Yes. Yeah. Notice Tonopah is much darker. Uh, and then down to Goldfield, down to Beatty, and then eventually down to Death Valley. So this, this route is anchored on the West with Death Valley National Park and with Great Basin National Park on the uh, east side, thus Park Park in the dark. They're both dark sky national parks. And that, of course, is Rima Peak in Cree Dome Light with the constellation of Orion up there and uh, Sirius on the far west side. And from this 
roughly same location taken at the, in full darkness. This is the view to the east. And again, I wanted to point out, this is the light from uh, Delta, about 93 miles, and more importantly, the sky glow from the Wasatch Front at about 138 miles out. So to understand how we look at or how we what we're working on this park and park in the dark highway, it's it's what we're doing is trying to determine that this goes through a really dark area, promote it as a dark sky astrotourism area. The communities along the way, in fact, we have Baker's working on becoming a dark sky community, Ely's working on it, Goldfield is showing an interest in it, and by the way, Gerlach is also showing an interest in becoming a dark sky community. And this is part of this coalition that we are to save one of the natural resources that we never thought would become endangered, but it has, those are the dark skies. And to fully understand how we measure this dark sky, I have to return to this vehicle. This again is uh, underneath the uh, Boring Peak area, and it has a mobile sky quality meter and a GPS unit attached to a computer so it can record continuous readings while the vehicle is moving. We have logged readings along the entire park to park route. This is what these look like. These readings are in, we call it MPAS, it's MPSAS, which stands for magnitude per square arc seconds. It's something amateur astronomers came up with in order to determine how dark a sky is. And as you can see from the scale over here on this side, uh, it, these lighter colors, the pinks, the reds, the yellows, the greens are showing the levels of darkness. You get up into the blues, dark blues, and finally into the grays, and you get into the really dark skies. A really good dark sky is over 21.8 on the impasse scale. The uh, inner cities run about 15, and the bottom of the scale is just right out around 15. Um, you can notice, though, that most of this route is blue and dark blue. Uh, a little bit of a light go around uh, Tunnel but then we brought back down as we get into the southern areas. I want to particularly show this area, which was the darkest area I've logged so far on this road. And you can see from the colors that you know the, the darkest dark blues are getting way up there towards the top, over uh, 21.9, pushing 21.9. And the other thing that happens is I'm driving the road with the, whole, with the headlight beams on low and up on top of the van, over 10 feet above the ground is the dark sky meter in a with piece of, short piece of ABS, black plastic, don't shield it from anything coming in from the side. But I did stop occasionally and made what I call the calibration stop right here, turn the lights off into a series of readings. We'll zoom into that. So here's the readings around that area and they're running again up into this blue and really, really dark blue area. But when I stop and turn off the lights, I'm picking up roughly another uh, 0.05 on this scale. So it's 0 0.05 darker. So if you want to know more about our program, our, uh, what, what we do, and about dark skies, feel free to contact us. Uh, visit our website, and uh, I'll end it there. We'll open it for questions. Thank you. Oh, I'm gonna turn this on. Kirk, thank you so much. That was really fantastic. Um, before we open it for questions, I I guess I have just. I think maybe two that, that kind of piqued my interest. I wondered if you could speak to beyond the the reasons for you know maintaining dark skies like certification or levels in different areas. What is the, the positive impact that um, the amount of wildlife and the, the ecosystems that are in place would are also gaining from this sort of, of work? Well, we have another time for a presentation. Yeah, <laughs> so, so we'll get lunch and we'll be right back. Yeah. Right. Right. Birds and birds and birds. Right, exactly. That's one reason why I left this out of this discussion. There has been a lot of work done lately in uh, the importance of dark skies. I mean, everything from um, even in the local communities is 
birds navigate by starlight. And when they when there's artificial light sources on the ground, the birds are running into that. They're not finding their water sources. Birds will come out of the sky and try to land on the city thinking they're seeing stars on the you know, reflecting on water. Uh, it's so many different aspects. And I, you know, I, I don't not really prepared to talk about it extensively, but um, I think I just recently read that some of the, and this is in Africa, but I'm sure it applies to a lot of the animals around here, but one of the dung beetles is actually navigating the desert by starlight that they're hunting, which is really amazing. And I think for, for me, I was blown away when I found out how important the circadian rhythms are that humans have and maintaining that light and dark cycle. And I, I think the other thing is, is that there's a lot of safety concerns too. By like I said, when you go out and start living under that starlight, you very clearly can your vision just expands into the darkness. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I did want to bring up is, does anybody know what color the dark sky is at night? It does have a color. Most of our posters show it in blue or purple because that's what we want to see. Reality is we're not using the cones, we're using the rods in our eyes, which only see black and white. The photographs clearly show that the sky is greenish and maybe tends to red. And what that is, it has to do with the electrons that were ionized out of oxygen during the daytime falling back into the orbits. And it's pretty much the same thing that creates the northern lights, but at a much smaller scale. So if, when your eyes are really well adjusted, and hopefully your eyes are younger than mine, um, you can actually see some of those patterns moving around the sky because it's kind of a sporadic thing. So, but it's just the, I think for me, it's the human value as well as the wildlife value. And it's a natural resource that we should be looking at conserving with our public lands and other natural resources. But it, it makes so much sense with the the current trends towards thinking about blue light blockers and the way that we turn you know, turning off screens for an hour before you go to bed and things of that nature. That the impact of the light bleed from 175 miles away, as in one of your photos, would have on you know various um, various creatures, very, you know, various forms of wildlife that are trying to live and depend upon that nighttime to, um, to function in so many ways. Let's see, do we have any questions in the audience? I'm not going to pass the mic because the acoustics are actually pretty great. Yes, in the far back, we'll test the acoustic sound. Who is certifying the dark sky? So I'm going to repeat some of these questions so our online audience can hear them. And the question was, who is repeating, or who is certifying the dark sky? Maybe you're reporting that too. The organization that we're working oh, with and that the Massacre Grant Dark Sky Sanctuary was recognized. It's not really a certification of the rules or regulations, it's a recognizing that it is dark, therefore it reaches a certain quality of darkness. You know, it's uh, the International Dark Sky Association. And they have moved with leaps and bounds in the last 10 to 15 years. When I was in Chaco back in 2004, I was involved in a park service, which was starting to look at dark skies as a natural resource. And I remember bitter cold winter nights standing outside with a telescope mounted on a tripod that was connected to a camera system and a computer that was monitoring the dark sky by taking swaths of it and taking those cold dome photographs to see where the resources were. The system was really glitchy, didn't work. I get to half the night, the system would glitch and have to restart and initiate. But today they're a lot better. So the national parks have taken a lot of lead on looking at and monitoring the skies. The International Dark Sky Association has created a program of recognition and certification at you know communities. Um, Idaho has a dark sky reserve, which is amazing, but it includes the community of Ketchum, Idaho, and the other surrounding communities, along with dark sky sanctuaries within it in their wilderness areas. Is that answer your question? I have another question. Um, when you say these communities are working to become dark sky, the, the way the communities get dark sky recognition is to have uh, pretty much what they work is is on the community level. So it's like the city or you know even some of the county facilities. They scale the lights back to dark sky friendly light which mainly, I mean, there's a very simple rule. If you can see the light source, the light isn't working because lights are designed 
to light up what you need to see. And in places where that happens, I don't know if any of you folks have been done flight staff at night or gone up to the uh, Lowell Observatory of flight staff, but they've been working on dark skies for you know decades. And when I was up there, it blew me away because flight staff looks like a small hammer because of all the like, dark sky ordinances that they have in the city. Um, it's something that the, you know cities or towns or communities can embrace. And yet nobody's saying you have to do this and this, but you know, bring your lights down and make that effort. You can't get served up. Is there any hope that uh, I'm just gonna jump up the follow-up there? Is there any hope or action? or movement towards legislation that would certify or recognize dark skies as a, as a natural resource that would, you know, some of the things that jumped out to me is looking at the map of the, the night sky or the or Nevada in particular, that some of the brighter spots were mines um, and being able to, you know, classify a section of Nevada or just almost anywhere in the, in the United States as dark sky classified or certified and that there's a natural resource that has to be protected. So before a new mine can go in, just like with other environmental protections and studies that you would have to do, you would have to also you know, straight that you're going to protect the, the sky that was there before you were there. That, that's a really good question. That's that's one of the things that we are really looking into is you know, there are a lot of environmental regulations about what you can and cannot do on a public land. And this would be another one. Um, Part of it is, is that the Lighting Engineer Association has come up with, and you know, they have their standards of what lighting needs to be, like everything up to 125 foot candles for X number. And it's it's not the best light because, as I've said, if you can drop overall light levels, get the human eye to open up and see into the shadows, you actually don't have bright lit things, and then things are completely hidden in shadow. You've got a more uniform light. Take care, take advantage of those rods in your eye be able to see in the darkness. Uh, it requires kind of a sea change in the way that we're looking at doing things. But definitely, I, I think working with the federal land management agencies to consider that is, we, one of the stops on our way was the town of Ryala, which is BLM actually manages that. And they've got, it's a beautiful place to look at the dark skies. It's right outside of Beatty. But it was recently given to the BLM, and to protect the buildings there, they've got a couple of sodium vapor lights just sitting on those buildings. It's like, yeah, if you just went and shielded those and dropped them down to a, an orangish LED light, you do a couple of things. First of all, you'd save a tremendous amount of light because the LED lights require much less power, and you preserve those night nice skies. So people go out there, see the buildings, the buildings have the protection that they need from lighting, but they would also. Um, be able to see the night skies and get great pictures of that. It's an amazing area for nobody who really knows about it. It's a beautiful little ghost town and it's an outdoor art museum there. It's really fantastic. We kind of struggled with the idea of light protecting the building. Um, and I look forward to watching and seeing how that happens. Any other questions in the audience? Yeah, let's go one and then we'll go two. Yeah. So when you get your photographs, uh, are these time lapse uh, or you know what how do you take photographs like that? Uh, basically a camera with I mean my my typical thing I've got a digital SLR and I put it on the tripod, open it up to the highest sensitivity and or one of the highest don't want to go too high, get too much brand, but then um, open up the shutter for about 20 seconds and you've got to be careful. A really wide angle lens, 20 seconds will freeze the stars. Any longer than that, get up to about 30 seconds, things start moving. If you start using the tighter lens, then you really get star trails. So if you want the stars as they are, not the star trail. The other thing is, it's like, don't go out and spend a lot of money on that because on this last, we did a park to park trip last month uh, with some folks who were involved in it at Beatty and across the state. And um, the newest iPhone was taking images by my, my camera. And my friend was just, Pulling from the pocket, it's like, hey, look at this. It's like, what? I think we had a question right over here. Yeah. I was just thinking, what's going to happen when Tesla has its major security satellites all around space? That uh, I can see that I've been out at Walker River State Recreation Area, enjoying beautiful, beautiful dark skies um, down in the canyon, you know, at the elbow there. And uh, so, you know, good 
30 minutes with my wife around the campfire wondering if we were seeing aliens or what what was happening and why the night sky was so disrupted. Uh, there, there had, like, that's the start of that I want you Well, it's it's interesting because the first time I saw that, I was sure I finally seen the flying saucers on the day before my whole life. <laughs> but then it like said, no, that's a, that's a Starlink train traveling through. It is, it is an issue. Um, the more stuff we get up there, the more objects we're going to have moving through the stars, the more faux constellations we'll be having. And uh, I would have to say, because our board of directors chair is here, it's a bit out of the purview of Friends of the Bad Abilities to be counting on us. Um, <laughs> we have no claims for space. <laughs> yeah, no, they're very good. Yes. I just For our online audience, that was a reference to Cine Nevada, uh, which uh, is actively engaged in, in combating or distressing billboard lighting and, and digital billboard lights. And, and one of the other things to really point out is so it's outside of our, you know, we're mainly interested in wild lands, wild public lands in Nevada, but as you can see, the impacts of cities and surrounding places have on those areas and the darkness in that. It's a, you know, we've got this wonderful dark pool of light in Nevada, and it's going to take uh, kind of a sea change of the way we think about night and darkness and lighting to get all the community behind it, the city behind it, the mining companies behind it. But that's what things like the Massacre Rim and our Sky Sanctuary and this part of our group are doing, just trying to bring that up so that people start thinking about that. You know, yeah, that might be a good way to do it. Plus, you'll save a ton of money. And we don't need to spend all that energy trying to eradicate that. The, the city of Reno has an ordinance where you cannot take your light and put it on somebody else's property. And in the industrial area where we live, there are some companies that just totally ignore this. And I just wish that there was a way that we could get Reno to just enforce their own ordinances. Right, but one of the in Tonopah, they've actually made a dark star park just on the south side of town. It's up by the high school. It's kind of a really nice little facility. You go inside, there's a little chain link fence to kind of protect it from areas, some slats to stop the wind, and um, tables with platforms for putting telescopes up and looking. Uh, the Texaco station, right across the little swale, just put up these massive LED lights. And this, the people involved with Dark Sky Park with the text guy said, can we put like shields on that to keep them from shining into our area? And they said, no, you can't tell us what to do with that park. That's what we like. Yeah, so it's, it's again, peer pressure. Um, I, I think that's what happens is we start building momentum toward Dark Skies and the importance of Dark Skies in Nevada, showing how important Dark Sky tourism is. Uh, all of a sudden it's like, Maybe we should rethink this. And the wildlife, I and mean, there's tons of it. Again, uh, check out the International Dark Sky Association, IDA. I'm not sure their address, but just look it up and find it. They're the ones doing a lot of the full work on this. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we work with that to just uh, you know, attend their meetings and see what they're talking about and try to help them do. Yes? Does your group or another group um, have excursions? into the dark sky areas that people can join? We don't have excursions, but one of our one of our most active parts of our organization are our stewardship trips. In fact, Olivia up at the table who's sitting at the information table, she leads a lot of those trips. And um, those trips involve going out working. Uh, we have some of our star uh, wilderness, our stewardship people here for this time, including uh, Larry, Ray Dwyer is also on our board of directors. You can talk to him about that. You go out, you work, you get well fed, and you get to enjoy the dark sky nights. But nothing specifically about to see the night skies.
it's information yes. on what you just talked about. Yes. Website. Yeah, go to the website. And again, talk to Olivia. She can ask questions. Larry, right behind you, can ask questions. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Doesn't Great Basin National Park do dark sky visits? They, they do, yes. Great Basin National Park has a really active dark sky program, including bringing out the telescopes, uh, dark sky rangers, a dark sky junior ranger program for kids. The same with Death Battle. The national parks have a lot of those. Uh, like I said, the community of Tonopah has put some dark sky parties, or, uh, sky parties and stuff. Um, um, Cedarville, we have a dark sky festival up there in the summer. We might have to change it because that group smoked out last year and I just canceled it. But we'll see. I know that there's other organizations as you look at different wilderness areas across the state, such as the Friends of the Black Rock Desert, uh, who host uh, specific. Uh, Skywatch parties specifically around different uh, meteor showers, things of that nature. Um, and so I think that just looking for organizations such as that, that are very similar to Friends of the Nevada Wilderness, that you'll find a lot of those types of excursions or, or points of access to really go out and encounter the dark skies, as well as explore the Nevada Wilderness in the daylight. Um, I think just be mindful of everybody's time. Do we have any other questions? We can keep going. Um, Kirk, as we wrap up, I want to ask you one final question, which is, as we're a room of about 50 people here today, what is something that, you know, just on a small level that we can go home and do or start to think about uh, as far as changing actions in our own lives, and even in an urban environment, that'll reflect, you know, reflect in the direction of progress being made in, in darkening the bad skies? I think, I think we all can be, we think a lot especially our exterior lighting in our houses. Um, you know, put your, put outdoor lights on motion detectors, which means they're off all the time. Uh, unless something's out there. Uh, it's a great, great solution for security lights to do that. Um, I, I know that in some of the neighborhoods I've seen, people think that they need to light up the outside of the house to show people where their house is or something. I don't quite get that. Unfortunately, most of those stuff lights are on the ground pointing up. The side of the house, um, probably not necessary. If you do want outdoor lighting, keep it low. I mean, I've I've helped people take some even their their driveway light, and it was interesting. There were uh, kind of glows on the driveway, and they had uh, mercury vapor lights in them, or the compact fluorescents. They were blue. They were really bright. I brought them down to real low wattage LEDs. On the orange spectrum, shift things toward the orange, toward that night light, the night friendly light. You know, the lower you get down, get down to they rate it by Kelvin, which is Kelvin temperature. A twenty seven hundred degree Kelvin light is really good for the night. And try to find the lowest wattage that you need, and you're going to be reducing your energy costs. But you're also going to be creating a symbol that my my friend's property has those globes now. You look out going, is that the moon rising? <laughs> it looks like you know it looks natural, it fits into the environment, and it provides plenty of light light that's taken on that driveway. So it's been on my to-do list for a while, so you might see put my driveway replaced all of my house lights since we can. Okay, I'll get a call to the light bulb. Um, I'd like to thank everybody again for coming out this afternoon. Um, a huge thank you to Kirk Peterson <laughs> Uh, another reminder, so Sophie Shepard's exhibition, The Moon's Tear, and Desert Night's Dream, is going to be on view, I think it's through the end of this week. It's coming down quick, so if there's somebody you want to share it with, bring them back. Um, this book is available for sale at the museum store. It's also available at Sundance Books, just behind us, and we definitely have to be one of those locations for picking it up. Um, we're, again, Sophie, I don't know if you're online with us, but we miss having Sophie here today. Um, and it's a fantastic book that I would recommend for everybody. Um, with that, I'd like to thank her. Thank you all for attending. Thank you to our online audience and Christina. And have a wonderful afternoon.